Okay, now everybody talk real loud. Good morning, Dan. Hello, good morning. Howdy. That's good. Okay, now what we're going to do is go through this again real quick. Okay, and one more time on this. And we should be up and running. Everybody talk again. That looks good, Dan. We've got your PowerPoint and we've got you on the screen. Okay, I don't have you. That's my only problem. Now I do. Okay, we're up and running. Okay. We lost your PowerPoint. Did you intend for that to happen? Yeah, I believe you'll get it right there. Yep. All right, uh, you're free, Wayne. Okay. Thank you, brother. You guys have a good morning. Okay, everybody can see the map on the screen there? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, this is a map of uh, Paul's uh, second missionary journey, the outbound in the red and the return in the green. You may have trouble seeing that, but right up at the very top of the map there on the left-hand side, you see Thessalonica. And you can barely see at the top of the screen Philippi. And Thessalonica and Philippi were two Greek cities in the province of Macedonia, named for Philip of Macedon, who was uh, the father of Alexander the Great. So uh, these two Greek uh, cities were prominent Greek cities. Philippi was a Roman colony, and uh, Thessalonica was very close to it. Berea was next to it. We know the, the, the Bereans from uh, the uh, uh, Acts 17.11 that says the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica for they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things Paul said were so. So um, Berea is just right next door there to Thessalonica. Uh, Greece was divided into two major provinces, Macedonia to the north and Achaia to the south. Athens and Corinth were part of Achaia, and Thessalonica and Philippi were part of uh, Macedonia. And of course, these are uh, cities uh, that have a long and ancient history, and we'll talk about them a little bit more. Uh, this next uh, slide that you see here is a modern day excavation of uh, the city of uh, Thessaloniki which is a modern uh, Greek city that sits on top of the ancient site of Thessalonica. And you can see the excavations of the first century city uh, down there below ground. And that's what's kind of left of some of the places that Paul was uh, today. Uh, the city of Philippi is uh, quite well excavated. And a lot of the ancient ruins from uh, the city of Philippi remain. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as time comes to study Philippians. We're going to be in Thessalonians first. This is the big stadium at uh, the city of Philippi that's been excavated. If you could go over there and visit, you could uh, see all those things and walk some of the same places uh, that Paul walked. See where Lydia and the Philippian jailer and uh, people like that lived, and Euodia and Syntyche and... Uh, Epaphroditus and a bunch of those people we read about in the Bible. Uh, the basic history that leads us up to uh, the book of Philippians is in the 17th chapter of Acts. And so uh, this is the background, or excuse me, for Thessalonians. I said Philippians. Uh, the 17th chapter of Acts. And on Paul's uh, missionary journey, uh, he's uh, traveling through some of these uh, Greek cities Amphipolis and Apollonia and they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews it says the Jewish synagogues were all over the place and Paul's modus operandi in teaching and preaching was usually to go to the Jews first and then to the Greeks and almost always he would start with the Jewish synagogue in whatever city he went to and uh, he would uh, speak to the people there, and then if he didn't get much response there, he would turn to the Gentiles. So there was a synagogue of the Jews there, 
And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Let me get my Bible over here. Your picture on that end is really fuzzy for some reason. I have no clue why. But, uh, it's clear a minute ago. Everybody talk for a minute. No, we love it there. We see you. <laughs> we still see you. Yeah, I see you too, but you're real fuzzy. That that Pagidipali and that Dalani guy, and all them are just kind of stretched out there. But anyway. I don't know, it's because the camera is not used to me. <laughs> That's what it is. You're too beautiful for the camera. That's what it is. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. So when you when you go to the book of Acts and, and you think about the Jewish synagogues, the synagogues were the places of, of teaching and learning uh, that the Pharisees basically operated. And uh, the synagogue didn't come into being until... Uh, the Babylonian captivity period. There's no such thing if you look in your Old Testament as a synagogue. In fact, you can't look in any any Old Testament book and find a synagogue. The temple was that holy uh, place in uh, Jerusalem that was the one place that God uh, selected for worship. But when the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. when the Babylonian captivity occurred, uh, the temple was no longer and people were taken to Babylon or uh, what is modern day Iraq. And so they couldn't carry on their Mosaic Levitical worship like the Old Testament uh, talks about. They couldn't offer their sacrifices. They couldn't uh, participate in all the rituals of the temple. Uh, they couldn't do the Levitical music or the in incense offering or any of the rest of that stuff. So what did they do? They they rented buildings. They they had houses that they gathered in, and so these gathering places where the Jews gathered to pray and read scripture. It had nothing to do with Levitical worship, which is the worship of the Old Testament temple. But they would gather, and uh, by the way, sunagoge. You've had that in your Greek class probably is a word which means uh, a gathering place, a gathering, an assembly. So a synagogue is just a gathering place. And there were synagogues all over Palestine and synagogues in every city where there were Jews almost, but there was only one temple. And that temple was in what city, class? Jerusalem. 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 The place which the Lord our God chose and it ordered David uh, to have his son Solomon build it. So uh, anyway, there was a synagogue of the Jews, just a gathering place there. And uh, Paul went into uh, the synagogue on the Sabbath day for three days. Now, in the synagogue, there was a ritual or routine that went on. And if you'll turn your Bibles to Acts 13, he kind of shows us what that routine was. If you look at Acts 13, beginning with verse uh, 13, and let's see, Dexter, what was your what was your first name again? Quentin. Uh, yeah, De Quentin. It's Decker, right? Yes, sir. Quentin, read read starting in Acts 13:13 13, 13, and read down through uh, verse 15, please. <clears throat> Now Paul and his companions went out to the sea from the Pacos mm -hmm. and came to the first. Excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, but, John, <clears throat> but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going to the Perida, they revived in the Pisidian and uh, Antioch. Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, <clears throat> they went to the synagogue and sat down. After, <clears throat> after the reading of the law, and the prophets in the synagogue officially, <clears throat> officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of uh, exhortation <clears throat> for the people, say it. Paul All right. It up. All right, that's good. Now, back up to verse uh, 15. He says, After the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue ruler sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message 
of exhortation for the people, please speak. So every Saturday in the synagogues around the Roman Empire, there was a tradition that first there would be a reading from the law. That's somewhere from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. And then there would be a reading from the prophets. And the prophets start with Joshua and go all the way to Malachi, see? So the law and the prophets were divided into sections, not chapters and verses at that point, but they were divided into sections designed to be read every Sabbath day. So the, the size of the section was a function of how many weeks it took to get through the law and how many weeks it took to get through the prophets. So they were rather lengthy sections at times. Uh, and, and they were like humongous chapters, you might say, to be read on that particular Sabbath day. So scripture reading out loud was a big deal in the um, Jewish synagogues. And what would usually happen was there would be a scripture reading from the law and then somebody would comment or make a lesson off of a scripture that they read. There would be a scripture reading from the prophets and somebody would comment or make a, an expository sermon off of the scripture that was read from the prophets. So that's what you have going on there. So there was lots of scripture reading and commenting. So it wasn't difficult for Paul to go into the synagogue and being a recognized uh, leader among the Pharisees, a student of the great Gamaliel, who's in the Mishnah, who was one of the uh, great rabbis of the Tanaitic period, uh, Paul was asked to preach sometimes, and he stood up and he could talk to them about the particular scriptures and particularly uh, talk with them about Christ. For example, you remember back in Acts 8.35 that uh, it says that Philip opened his mouth and beginning from that same scripture he preached unto him Jesus. But the scripture he was preaching from was Isaiah 53, and that was a reading from the prophets. So Paul did that same sort of thing. He took texts from the prophets that were about Jesus, and he reasoned with the Jews and tried to tell them that these things were about Christ, and he told them about Jesus Christ uh, whenever he could. So three Sabbath days is at least three weeks, maybe four weeks. So three to four weeks Paul spent in Thessalonica trying to reason uh, with the local Jews. It says he was explaining and giving evidence. See, that's some of the things that, that we need to do as preachers. We need to explain and give evidence. We need to share with people that, uh, is that, what does the uh, New American say? Is this the New American or another version up here? Uh, mine's out of New American Standard. Well, what does verse 3 say in the New American Standard, anybody? Does it say explaining and giving evidence? <clears throat> then when they, is that what you want me to read? 13.3? Acts 17.3. Oh, 17. It doesn't have to be Quentin, it can be anybody. What does it say? Explaining and giving evidence is what it All says. right. So, so one of the things that... that Paul was doing in his preaching was explaining things and giving evidence. Some people think that when you preach, you have to get people all excited emotionally or you have to entertain them or whatever. But one of the, one of the things that we're supposed to do in our preaching is we're supposed to explain what the truth is and why it's the truth and show why that's the right thing by giving evidence. So explaining and giving evidence is part of what we do. And some of this was explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And he was saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is Christ. What does the word uh, Christ really mean? Uh, let's see here. J.R., what do you think? What's the question? What does the word Christ really mean? Um... Who's in? What's that? Messiah. Messiah. What does that see? That's sort of like saying, um, gracias. Well, okay, Christ and Messiah. Christ is a Greek word. Messiah is a Hebrew word. They are the same word, just translated into two different languages. So that's like saying Christ means Christ. So what do both of those words mean? Anointed. Who said that one? 
Manny. Manny, good job. Anointed. And who was mainly the anointed one in the Old Testament? Kings, prophets, and priests. In Jewish prophecy, the, the Christ, the Messiah, like Psalm 2, was basically the king. So um, if you go back to Acts 2, verse 36, where Peter said, uh, let, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom we crucified both Lord and Christ. Well, Lord means ruler or master, see? That's the Greek term. Christ means the anointed king. That's the Hebrew term. Both of those things mean the one that's in charge of everything, the one that rules over everything, king. So he was proclaiming the kingship of Jesus and that he has risen from the dead and that he is alive. And it says some of them were persuaded. The word persuaded gives you another thing we do with our preaching. See, verse 3 says we explain and give evidence. Verse 4 says we persuade. So we explain, we give evidence, and we persuade. We're trying to convince people of something. We're trying to sway them. We're trying to persuade them, to prove them. So some of the people were persuaded by what Paul had to say. And they joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leaving, uh, leading women. So this seems to mean that some of the Greeks who were interested in Judaism, who had been attending the synagogue, some of those Greeks were, were persuaded, and some of the Jews were persuaded, and some of the leading women in the city were persuaded. And because this happened, it caused an uproar in the Jewish com uh, community. Verse 5 says, But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and coming upon the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out unto the people. So this Jason evidently had been uh, keeping uh, Paul in his home, and they wanted to drag him out and ask him what in the world was going on and why they were upsetting uh, their city. And so when they did not find them, uh, that is, they didn't find Paul and his companions, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities. Now, the interesting thing about this, this business about the city authorities, is this is a particular Greek word, polytarch, P-O-L-Y, I'll go real slow for you, P-O-L-Y-T-A-R-C-H, P-O-L-Y, T-A-R-C-H, or you could spell it P-O-L-I, T-A-R-C-H. It's a Greek word. But uh, poly, P-O-L-Y, is the word from which we get political and politics. And the Greek word P-O-L-I-S, pi, omicron, lambda, iota, sigma, that word polis means city. City, polis. City, polis. So poly, that part of the word means city. And the word A-R-C-H, A-R-C-H, is a word which means ruler. So this word polytarch is a ruler of the city. It's the city authorities. Uh, one of the interesting things about Thessalonians and in, in early literature is this word is actually found in inscriptions, uh, archaeological inscriptions at Thessalonica, and it seems that nowhere else in the, in the ancient world were the city officials called by this particular title. Luke uses this word in the, in the book of Acts, and sure enough, this is exactly the word that ancient inscriptions have that shows what the officials of the cities of Thessalonica uh, were uh, called. That's pretty amazing. It shows how accurate Luke is in, in the use of even his terminology of what the particular leaders of this particular city were called. It shows that he's writing uh, accurate historical accounts, if not fiction, about what happened a long, long time ago in a far-off galaxy.
galaxy. So, uh, anyway, uh, the city authorities uh, got dragged into this, and the Jews were upset, and they said, these men who have upset the world have come here also. Uh, the King James tradition, these men who have turned the world upside down come here also. So, the teaching about Christ upset the Jewish synagogue. It caused a division in the Jewish synagogue. The few that were persuaded, some of the leading ones that were persuaded left, and it, it upset their whole apple cart, and it caused them to cause trouble for uh, Paul and his companions through the city. And uh, Jason, uh, the charges went on, Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Remember when... Uh, <coughs> In the, in the Gospel of John, Pilate had Jesus before the Jewish crowd, and he said, Behold your king. And they said, We have no king but Caesar. And they said, Anybody who, who lets him live is no friend of Caesar, because Jesus said he was a king. And remember the sign over the cross of Jesus that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the what? King of the Jews. The king of the Jews. So... Nobody was supposed to be a king except Caesar, the Roman emperor, Tiberius. And uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, this was supposed to be insurrection. That's how they got around to getting the city officials involved in it. And so they stirred up the crowd, they being the Jews. See, they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities. That is, the Jews stirred up the crowd and the Jews stirred up the city authorities, the polytarchs who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. But then what happened with Paul is, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Now remember from our first uh, picture that we had on our map, we'll get back there in just a second. If you look up at the very top of the map there, Berea is just a little ways to the west of Thessalonica. And so that's where Paul had to get out of town and go to Berea. And the Bereans, it says, were a, a more receptive crowd than the ones in Thessalonica. It says the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, um, how do we know what Paul said was true? What would you say about that, uh, Manny? Is it that you don't like me, or that you didn't hear me, or that you don't know? I don't know. Okay, that's good. Say it out loud. Um, Levi, how do we know that what Paul said was true? Because he's an inspired writer. He was inspired by God. He was an apostle of God. Of course, that's, that's what we accept. But even an inspired apostle. The, the word of an inspired apostle, if it was really inspired, would never contradict the foot. Anything else that God said. That's right, with the rest of God's holy scriptures. What scriptures do you think these guys were examining? Anybody want to volunteer? J.R., what would you think? All the scriptures? Uh, well, from what I know is whatever Paul is teaching to them, Okay, but like what part of the scriptures would these people probably have, have been examining at this time? Like the laws or the prophets? <laughs> right. They would be examining the scriptures of the Old Testament because the scriptures of the New Testament hadn't been written yet. And uh, so, or were in the process of being written. So anything that the apostles said had to be uh, in agreement with uh, the Old Testament scriptures. But if you remember back earlier, it says that Paul, in verse 2, was reasoning with them from the Scriptures, it says, explaining and giving evidence that was from the Scriptures 
that the Christ had to suffer. And uh, if you'll look back at Luke 24, just take your time to turn your Bible back there. Luke 24, verse 44 through 47. and always like to sit. What's your name again? Yeah, me? Yep. Yeah. I'm Eli. Eli? You haven't changed since we talked last, huh? Nope. Okay. So, uh, oh, I'm moving my camera instead of your camera. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is that better? Yeah, much better. Okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to manipulate your camera. So I can get out of that sunlight a little bit. Let's see if I can do it here. That's weird. Weird. That's his beard. Okay. I have a question. At this time, Paul's talking to the Persians, right? Talking to who? What was your question? Ask me again. Uh, I said, who's Paul reasoning with right now? He's reasoning with, in Acts 17, the um, Jews that are in the synagogue at Thessalonica, along with some of the locals that are visiting the synagogue. See, that's where he is, and he's in Thessalonica in the synagogue reasoning with them. And verse 4 says, some of them were persuaded, but that made the Jewish establishment, the Jewish leaders, really angry, and they dragged uh, Jason, one of the leading Christians, in front of the city authorities. What was the word for city authorities? Anybody remember? Polytarchs. 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 And one of the striking evidences of Luke's Accuracy is the fact that uh, in ancient Thessalonica we found that word, which seems to have been a unique word to describe uh, the leaders of that particular city. So anyway, um, verse 11, they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I find it fascinating that uh, if you look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, See, we're working up to the, the introduction of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Comparing Acts 17, verse 11. He says, And for this reason we thank God, without ceasing, that when you received from us the word of the message, even the word of God, you did not receive it as the word of man, but as it is truly the word of God, which also works in you that believe. So, these people who were converted to Christ in Thessalonica received the message as the word of God, believing that it was the word of God. So, Paul must have done a pretty good job uh, when he persuaded not only them, but the people over in uh, Thessalonica. So many of the Jews believed, as also did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So the congregation at Thessalonica was started, it was begun. But then, uh, see what happened, we're going to get to Thessalonians here in just a minute. Uh, then what happened was, see, Paul was no longer in Thessalonica and Paul kept traveling. And what Paul left in Thessalonica was a city in an uproar with the city officials angry and the Jews were angry and these Christians that he'd only had three or four weeks with, they were brand new Christians, <coughs> excuse me, and they were left without the leadership of a Paul or somebody else like that and they were being persecuted by the Jews and the city officials 
primarily by the Jews. And so how in the world were they going to survive? You know how delicate people are when we, when we teach the gospel to them. And we hope they're going to stay faithful to the Lord. Uh, you know how delicate those people <coughs> are and how difficult it can be uh, to keep them faithful to the Lord. So these people didn't have much of a chance, it didn't seem like. And Paul was very, very worried about them. And uh, it was because he was worried about them uh, that he ended up writing the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> In fact, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. In verse 1, Paul says, Wherefore, when we could no longer stand it, when we could no longer bear it, <coughs> what does the uh, New American say there? Endure. When we could no longer endure it, we were pleased to uh, be left behind in Athens alone. Remember, Athens is down there in, near Corinth in the south. <coughs> he said we were pleased to be left behind in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and fellow worker of God in the gospel of Christ, <coughs> that he might strengthen you and encourage you concerning your faith. See, they, Paul had to know what happened to these people. Did they hang in there? Did they remain faithful? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, did they... Uh, did they let the Jews turn them back to Judaism? Did they just give up altogether as Christians? What happened? I got to know, he says. So he sent Timothy to find them and to encourage them. But look at verse 6 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And this tells us exactly why Paul wrote Thessalonians. And just now, Timothy has come to us from you. So Timothy had just returned from Thessalonica to report back to Paul. Even now, Timothy has just come to us from you and has brought us the good news about your faithfulness and about your love and that you have good remembrance of us always, uh, <clears throat> wanting to see us just like we want to see you. And for this reason, we are encouraged, brothers, by you in all your necessity and affliction because of your faith, because now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. In other words, we're just so happy to find out that you are still Christians and you're still hanging in there and you're still being faithful. And because Paul was so thankful and he wanted to give them some extra encouragement, that's why Paul wrote this uh, particular letter. Okay? Anybody want to ask any questions about that? Now, how did we figure that out? It's right out of the Bible, isn't it? See, because it says right in the Bible, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, that when they couldn't stand it any longer, they sent Timothy to find out if they were okay. And in verse 6, it says that Timothy had just now got there from the Thessalonians, and that they were so glad about uh, the fact that the Thessalonians were... Uh, still believers, and that gives you what we call the occasion of the Thessalonian epistle. The occasion means what prompted Paul to write it. Why did Paul write this particular letter? What was the occasion that prompted him to put pen to paper and, and write this? And then we have discovered what that is. <clears throat> Let me show you some uh, key passages that we're going to look at here in, in just a little bit. Look at, uh, compare 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, We thank God always for all of you. See that? We thank God always for all of you. Everybody see that? Raise your hand. You do. Okay. Then look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, where he comes back to it again and he says for this reason we also thank God always that's number two 
And then look at over here at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, <clears throat> 3, verse 9, where he says, For what thanksgiving can we possibly give to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice because of you before our God, night and day, uh, more abundantly begging to see your face and fill up what is lacking on the part of your faith. So Paul thanks God in chapter 1, verse 2. He thanks God again in chapter 2, verse 13. And he just about busts thanking God again in chapter 3, verse 9. And what in the world is he so thankful about, actually, that he's been so worried about? That they're still faithful. That they're still faithful and that they have not given up their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this shows clearly why the epistle is, is written. So on that structure, we thank God. That's how the first three chapters are built, around those th three thanksgivings. We thank God, chapter 1, verse 2. For this reason, we also thank God, chapter 2, verse 13. And we thank God, chapter 3, verse 9. So there's three times that it happens. And it gives you a lot of insight as to uh, what was going on in the writing of the epistle. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to try to change to my back camera. And uh, I'm going to do that because I can see that one better. The front one is messed up for some reason. So give me just a beat here. Camera. Now you don't have me, do you? Zoom. Do you? Yeah. <clears throat> Is it zoomed in there and everything kosher? Yeah. It's kind of foggy on the right side, but it's good. It's good? Okay. I can see you guys a whole lot better than I could on the other way. So we'll work this way for a while. All right. Let's uh, see if anybody in the class would like to ask some questions. I couldn't see you very well before, and now I can. Who would like to ask some questions? Yes, sir. Roger? Yes, sir. I wanted to know, what was the theme of the book of Thessalonians? Is it a... <coughs> okay. Thankfulness? Well, thankfulness is one of the themes, and I like your question. Because it shows you've been hanging around with Denny a little bit. Uh, how do you find the theme of a book, Roger? How would you answer that question? It depends on um, several factors, inclu including the frequency of the wording. Okay. The frequency of the wording, in other words, if there are certain words or phrases that occur over and over and over and over again in a particular book, then that is probably a theme or a thematic phrase to that book. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Brother Roger? Yes, sir. Okay. So what we're going to do, rather than me just telling you what the themes are, we're going to explore the book of Thessalonians, and we're going to note when those recurring words occur and we're going to find the themes together. And, and by doing that, we're going to actually show you how to do exegetical work instead of just doing it for you and feeding it to you. In, in other words, if you're going to be a mechanic, rather than me fixing your car for you, it would be better for you to get the tools and get under the car and actually let me show you how to fix the car and you do it yourself and then you'll really know how to fix the car. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Okay, that's what we're trying to do in this class. Somebody else. But but we thank God is definitely a, a recurring phrase that is in there some, and it's very important. Okay, somebody else ask a question. Are you real shy? Raise your hands if you're real shy. <laughs> okay, well, you need to get over that because 
If you're going to stand up and preach the gospel to people that you can't be real shy, you got to just go out there with <clears throat> All right. Let me just give you a brief little um, uh, segment here for a few moments on uh, exegetical method before we go any further into studying uh, Thessalonians. Uh, have you had a class in exegesis already? Yes, yes sir. All right, well, let's see if this jives with what Denny taught me in, in the class in exegesis. Uh, <clears throat> we've already said that when you, when you come to a book of Scripture, any book of Scripture, doesn't matter what book of Scripture, you're going to look for recurring words and phrases. Uh, those, that's one of the things you're going to do. Uh, you come to a book like you've never seen it before. <clears throat> one of the biggest mistakes we make is we have certain things that we want to know, <coughs> excuse me, and certain things perhaps that we want to prove, and we come to the Bible asking our questions or wanting to prove our issues, whatever those are. <coughs> That's a terrible way to study the Bible. That's like putting blinders on yourself. Because if you're just looking for a particular thing, you're going to miss a lot of things that are there. So what you need to do is <clears throat> come to a book of Scripture as if you've never read that book before. And you need to start looking for things, whatever it happens to be there that seems to be occurring uh, with some frequency. Uh, it could be uh, uh, some kind of grammatical structure, uh, like, for example, in the book of Romans, uh, Paul says over and over again, what shall we say then? And he does that when he's drawing things to a conclusion. He does that repeatedly. Uh, in the book of Corinthians, there's the little phrase, now concerning. And that little phrase, now concerning, <coughs> starts at chapter 7, verse 1, where Paul says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote. And in chapter 7, verse 25, he says, now concerning virgins, somewhere in there. And uh, then... Uh, uh, later on in chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now concerning things offered to idols. You know, and in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts. And uh, he'll talk about concerning the resurrection from the dead. So that phrase, now concerning, divides up the book. How do you know that? Because it recurs all the way through there. And you can see where he uses it. So you're looking for anything like that uh, that recurs. <clears throat> you're also looking for um, content that recurs. Uh, and sometimes that's a little more difficult to see. But, for example, in the book of Daniel, uh, you come to chapter 1 and you've got the story of the three uh, young men who were uh, faced with this moral dilemma and they were supposed to eat the king's rich food, the king's food that was not clean by Jewish standards. And so what are we going to do? We're captives. Are we going to eat this stuff and compromise our morals? Or are we going to be faithful to God's law and refuse to eat it? <clears throat> so they refused to eat it and they trusted in God. And instead of getting killed or something, God delivered them. And everything turned out all right. And they got fatter and sassier than all the rest of them. And everything was, was fine. Well, that's, that's story number one. Then you get over there to Daniel chapter 3. And all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, says, Everybody, when I put this big statue up, everybody fall down and worship. Well, here's the same three young Hebrew men. And they said, oh, wait a minute now. We're not supposed to do that. What are we going to do? So just like chapter 1, they have a moral dilemma. They're, they're being required to do something that they're not supposed to do. And they say, well, we, don't, we can't do that. And they say, well, if you don't do that, <clears throat> we're going to throw you into this fiery furnace and burn you to a crib. And they said, well, whether you burn us up or not, we can't do that. And our God is able to deliver us. And so you remember they threw them into the fiery furnace and then... God or an angel was in there with them and delivered them, and they didn't even get the hair of their heads singed. They came out, and the people that threw them into the fire got burned up, and so God delivered them again. Well, you read along in the book of Daniel, and you come over to Daniel chapter 6, and the king Darius says, uh, nobody's supposed to pray to anybody but me. 
And so here's Daniel, and Daniel's got a dilemma because who are we supposed to pray to? God and God alone. And it's not just any God. It's not uh, Kali or Buddha or or uh, any of the others. It's not Allah. It's not any of those gods. It's, it's Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to pray to Him. So Daniel knows this. What am I going to do? I can't pray to him. So he says, well, I'll just do like I always do and pray to God. Do you see any similarity in those three stories? See, they're really all the same story, aren't they? <clears throat> in each story, you have the people of God presented with the moral dilemma. They, they, they are presented with something that they can't do in good conscience. And either they're going to compromise or they're going to trust God. And every time they trust God, what does God do? He delivers them. And you find that a key phrase in the book of Daniel is our God is able to deliver us. And three stories that support that theme are the story of the three young men and their food and the story of the three Hebrew children in the fire and the furnace and the story of Daniel and the lion's den. That's called similarity of content. Let me give you another example <clears throat> from the Gospel of Luke. Um, let's see here. Who's in? Who's the one in the <clears throat> kind of a, a hefty-looking guy behind Jr.? He's bigger than you, Jr. The guy right behind you. Okay, blue shirt. Yeah, it's Perry. Perry. What's the last name again? Stilts. Stilts. Perry. Uh, in how many Gospels do we find the story of the rich fool? You know, the guy that uh, tore down the barns and built bigger barns and this night you're going to die? I don't know. Anybody? Huh? Four. Eh. That's a little sound I make like when you're wrong. Eh. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else want to get in on that? Three. Eh. One. Yes. It only it only occurs in the Gospel of Luke. Okay, and it's about a guy that's rich. Now, you know, how many of you know this song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. You know that song? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, the story of Zacchaeus is in Luke 19. And he was a little short man, but the main point that Luke makes with it was he was rich. And in Luke 19, I think it's about verse 8 or 9, when he, when he repents, he says, Half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody of anything, I'm going to pay back fourfold. So that story of Zacchaeus and how salvation came to his house, how many Gospels do you think that's in? <clears throat> One. One. It's in the Gospel of Luke only. All right, now let's think of another one. Let's think of uh, the uh, story of uh, the unjust steward. Anybody remember that story? The, some, some Bibles call it the parable of the shrewd manager. It's in Luke 16, the first several verses. It's about this guy that that was a shrewd manager and he was really being dishonest with his master's uh, uh, books and stuff. And so the master was going to fire him. And so he was real shrewd. And so he called in some of his master's debtors, some of the big businessmen around. And he said, you know, you owe 500 gallons of oils. Quickly take your bill and write down 450. You know, I don't know the exact figures. But he did that several times and he actually cheated the guy that was working with him. But he did good by the other powerful people around. And he did it so that when he got fired, he'd get a job with the people that he helped on the outside. <clears throat> and Jesus' point was, later on, <clears throat> in verse 10 and 11 and 12, that if you can't be honest with what's entrusted to you on this earth, why would God want to entrust you with true riches? Guess how many Gospels that story is in? One. Only the Gospel of Luke. Um, there's several stories like that, all of which have to do with people that are rich. 
the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 and following, where the poor man uh, was begging to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, only in the Gospel of Luke. Well, what's, what's, what do these stories have in common? The rich fool, the unjust steward, the uh, rich man and Lazarus, uh, the rich tax collector, uh, Zacchaeus, uh, the story of the widow's mite, same, same. What do all of those stories have in common? They're all about riches and about the corrupting power of riches and about how you handle money and who it really belongs to. And they all only occur in the Gospel of Luke. That is, Brother Roger, what we call similarity of content. It shows a thematic strand through the Gospel of Luke where there is a concentration on an issue, and that is the issue of riches and how you deal with riches as a Christian. Okay? So you've got similar words and phrases, but you've also got similar content that has a certain point that it keeps uh, centering in on. And you've got similar grammatical structure, and uh, uh, those are the main things. But basically, exegesis is about using the book itself to interpret the book. Now, you probably did this too, but <clears throat> write this down in case you haven't. The first thing we start out with when we're doing exegesis is a passage. Or you could call it a pericope. Denny, Denny probably made you call it a pericope, which is a little... A little piece of scripture, whatever piece of scripture you're dealing with. A verse, a couple of verses, something like that. Okay? And how do you how do you know what that verse means? Well, there's only one way, exegetically, and that is context. You have to see how that little piece of scripture fits into the flow of thought of the chapter or two that it's in. There's a discussion going on there. What's being discussed? How does that little verse fit into the discussion in that chapter? So first you have the pericope, <coughs> which is the, the little, or the, the verse, the, the little passage, you know, the little bitty piece of scripture. Then you have the section. The section is like uh, a, a section of text in a book. It's not necessarily a chapter at all. It's wherever the book actually divides. Like, for example, in, in 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> Paul says in chapter 8, verse 1, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. You know, how, you know where that section ends up? It ends up in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or right at the end of chapter 10. It goes all the way through chapter 8, all the way through chapter 9, all the way through chapter 10. At chapter 10, verse 14, he comes down to the conclusion of it and says, Flee from idolatry. He tells them they don't have any business eating things sacrificed to idols. And he tells them in the end of chapter 10, How can you uh, sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons at the same time? But he started that discussion back in chapter 8, verse 1 where he said concerning things sacrificed to idols. So anything in that section, you have to place it within the context of that discussion, what's going on in that section, or else you're taking it out of its context. For example, one of my favorite scriptures, 1 Corinthians 9, let's turn to it. 1 Corinthians 9, love this passage. 1 Corinthians 9, I think it's either 15 or 16. Read 15 and 16 there for me, Mommy. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die, than that any man should make my glory, glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to uh, glory of, for a city is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Alright, back up to verse 14. See if 14 is what I meant. Uh, even so hath the Lord ordained that 
They which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. All right, that's my that's my real favorite verse. They which preach the gospel should live the gospel. That means the people that are being taught should support monetarily the people that are doing the teaching. Yay, Rob, I'm glad that's in there. You know, that makes me be able to have clothes, food, and all kinds of things without working a secular job or doing surgery or doing whatever else I have to do. So that's great. But the, the point of this is really not that. See, oftentimes we'll come, you know, should preachers be supported? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14. Okay, fine. But that's not really the point of what Paul's saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he starts out, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Do I not have the right to uh, lead about a wife uh, who is a sister like the rest of the apostles? All this kind of stuff. Paul talks about three or four different things that he has the right to do. And even having the right to do them, he chooses not to do them because they might be harmful uh, to his pursuit of preaching the gospel or to uh, other Christians or whatever. Those three things are he has the right to be married, but he's given up that right. He has the right to eat meat, and he's given up that right. He has the right to take support from the Corinthians, but he's given up that right. And his point is, some things that you may technically have the right to do, it would be better for the cause of Christ if you give up that right. And the thing that he's actually talking about in the whole context from 1 Corinthians 8 all the way through 1 Corinthians 10 is eating meat sacrificed to idols. And he finally comes out in 1 Corinthians 10 and says, there's no way you ought to be doing that in the city of Corinth. You ought to give up that right. You ought to run the other direction from idols. Because if you get too close, you're going to get burned. So, it's interesting that, you know, the real intended meaning of that passage is lost on most people because they don't place it in the context of the discussion in which it appears you understand what I'm saying? Raise your hand if you think you do. That's real timid. How many of you do not have a clue what I'm getting at? Raise your hand, because I want to know. Well, I didn't get all the people, so some of you didn't volunteer either way. Let me go through this again. Do you understand what I'm getting at about context? Raise your hand if you think you do. Oh, there it is. The hands are actually up. You poor, shy little creatures. They are. Yeah, um, could you actually put it in one sentence or one paragraph, what uh, Paul says about um, 1 Corinthians 9 itself again, please? Okay, let me see if I can do this. The statement about preachers receiving support. is an example of giving up our rights for the good of the gospel. And um, his point in the discussion is that we should give up the right to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols. See, it's not good enough just to take the passage out of the context and let it mean whatever you want to mean. Why did Paul, what was Paul actually trying to say? See, there's, we want to prove, and we're not wrong in this, but we want to prove that preachers can be supported. Okay, there it is. But that wasn't Paul's main point. What was Paul's main point? And don't you think that it would be better for us to try to get what the main point was that Paul was trying to say by inspiration so we can get the major message that God wants us to get? The only thing that tells us what a scripture means is the context. Okay. Well, this is, this is a class in exegesis, but it is a class in the exegesis of a particular book. All right.
Anybody else want to ask a question before we go on and actually dive in a little bit to the text of Thessalonians? I'm going to get your um, grade sheet thing out because I like to be able to call you by name and look you in the eyeballs. You know, some people uh, become part of a congregation. They like to be a member of a larger congregation so they can slide in the back door and kind of hide, you know. Nobody will know who they are or bother them or anything like that. If that happens to be you, you're in the wrong class. Because I will hunt you and I will find you and I will know what's in your mind. And, and let me tell you this. I really do. I'm not kidding with you when I say that I want you to tell me. I'm not trying to pick on you. I want you to tell me if you simply do not understand or if you do not know. And if I ask you a question and you have no clue, I want you to say, I have no idea. So I don't waste my time and we can go on to somebody else or we can restate the question or something. Okay? It's not a shame to say I have no idea unless we've talked about it 50 times all through the semester and you don't have any idea. Then that could be, that could be a problem. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at 1 Thessalonians <clears throat> chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse 1. And uh, I'm just reading from the Greek text. You read from whatever you're reading from. How many of you have New American Standard? Okay, how many of you have an other ver another version? New King James. New King James, J.R.? And what I else? King James. King James, who has a King James? Money? Yes, sir. You mean like a 1611 type King James? Oh no, 1769. Okay. 1611. <laughs> the first one. Okay. May I ask respectfully why? Why did you choose that one? Oh, you, you mean what? What's that? Is it? Why are you using it? Is it just because that's the one you've learned more on, or something, or what? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's look at chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. Now, see, Timothy, we know him from a lot of places. He's one of the prominent figures because we found Timothy in, in the book of Acts, in Acts 15. And he was a companion of Paul in the book of Acts. And Timothy is the one that Paul sent to Thessalonica in chapter 3, verse 1 here, or 3, verse 2, uh, in order to find out if they were still faithful. And Timothy is the one who had just gotten back and told Paul that they were still faithful in chapter 3, verse 6, see? So Timothy is important here in this book of uh, 1 Thessalonians. Also, Timothy was the preacher for quite a while in the church at what city? Everybody say Ephesus. 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 In first and second Timothy, Timothy was the preacher at Ephesus. And so Timothy figures quite largely in the New Testament story. So Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God. Now that's interesting, isn't it? See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, it says to the church of God in Corinth. But here it says to the church of the Thessalonians in God. Interesting. What if you were called uh, the church of the Denverites? Would that be okay? Raise your hand if you think it would be okay. Raise your hand if you think it would not be okay. Interesting. Was it okay for Paul to call this group the Church of the Thessalonians? 
Yes. It was probably the only church. Ah, you're, you're talking practically though, right? Not scripturally. <laughs> yeah. Oh, probably. It's a group of people. Okay. So, what is the name of the church in the New Testament? Church of Christ. Well, there's just a lot of names. It's just the church. There are several. Actually, the truth of the matter is, the New Testament church did not have a name. That is a proper name. And if you look, for example, at Romans 16:16, 16, 16, you will find that Churches of Christ is not capitalized. Christ is not a proper name. It's simply saying the congregations that belong to Christ. If you look in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, you will find that Church of God is not capitalized. It's not a proper name. It's simply saying that this church belongs to God. It's a description. It's not a name. If you look at Acts 20, verse 28, it talks about the Church of God or the Church of the Lord. It's not capitalized there either. It's not a proper name. It just means the Lord's church or God's church. It's a description of the church. If you look in Hebrews 12, let's turn over there real quick. Hebrews chapter 12. And verse, what is it, 23, 22? <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 23, I think, to the general assembly and what? Church of the firstborn. Church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Jesus. Who said Jesus? Raise up your hand. No, sir. The firstborn is plural. The church of the firstborn ones, and if you keep reading, it says, which are, not is, but are enrolled in heaven. He's talking about Christians, the church of the firstborn. So that one doesn't refer to Christ, it refers to Christians, those that are enrolled as citizens, citizens in heaven. That's not a proper name, that's a description. So church of God, church of Christ, church of the firstborn, church of the Lord, none of those are names, they are descriptions. The only proper name assigned to the people of God in the New Testament is the name Christian. And 1 Peter 4, verse 16 says, If any man suffers as a Christian, a Christian, let him glorify God in this name. Okay? So, the church does not have a name. Now, one thing we have done in modern times is we have almost made a biblical description of the church, a denominational name, Church of Christ, as if that's the only thing you can call the church. And the true thing is, you can call the church anything as long as it's scriptural, as long as it's a biblical name. You can call it the Church of God, the Church of Christ, the Church of the Firstborn, the Church of the, uh, if it was in Thessalonica, you could call it the Church of the Thessalonians. But you'd have to explain that it was the group that believed in God or Christ. If, as long as it's a biblical name, you can call it anything. But the problem we have with a lot of places is they don't have biblical names. They have man-made names like Baptist Church, Methodist Church, Catholic Church. Those are the things that we don't find in the Bible. And so they're departing from uh, the Bible in that way. But what I want you to see here is the word ecclesia or church means a group or a gathering, a group. You know, you've heard etymologically that the word ecclesia means the called out, but that's really not how it was used in the first century. Ecclesia is used in Acts 19 for a mob. Uh, the Greek word ecclesia means a gathering, a group of people for whatever purpose. But this is a group of Thessalonians, a group of people in Thessalonica who are in God. That is, they have a relationship with God. And they are in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, they have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that what, that's what makes this group of people God's group. So the word church means group or gathering or an assembly. 
The Rotary Club is an ecclesia. The Lions Club is an ecclesia. The Boy Scouts is an ecclesia. Uh, there's all kinds of ecclesias. But we're interested in the ecclesia that is in God and in Jesus Christ. And that's what ecclesia he was writing to here. Okay? So at Thessalonica, thanks to Paul's reasoning with them for three Sabbath days in the Scriptures, uh, there was a group of people that had come to God and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the group of people, this is the church that he's talking about, the same group of people, uh, the same type of people that were added to the Lord's church on the day of Pentecost when they obeyed the gospel of Christ. But it's important, I think, to know what group we're talking about. <coughs> that group that began in what chapter in the book of Acts, Terry? Um, say that question. question again. The Thessalonian church began in what chapter in the book of Acts? Uh, two? Nope. Oh, oh. Um. J.R. 17? Yes, Acts 17. Acts 17. How long was Paul with them before he had to leave? Seth? We don't have a Seth, sir. Oh, I thought we did. Levi. Um, <laughs> that works. What? Three, three weeks. About three, three weeks. weeks. Three Sabbath days. That is correct. Okay. And Paul had to get out of Dodge. Where did he go when he had to run out of town? Where did he go right away there? Um, Brother Roger, do you remember? Went to Berea. He went to Berea. That's correct. And then he went on to other places, and he kept being worried about the people, whether they stayed faithful or not, because everybody was persecuting them. And uh, Quentin, who did he send to find out if they were okay or not? Timothy. How do you know? Because he gave him the encouragement. And uh, No, no, how do you chapter know? Three? How do you know chapter he three? sent chapter 3 where? Verse. Uh, verse I, I believe it's. Let me find it. Uh, verse three. That's what I believe. Verse two. two and three. Verse two and three. Okay, so he sent Timothy, and you know that because the Bible says so. And how do you know that Timothy had just gotten back when Paul sat down and couldn't stand it? He had to write this letter. Because he says so. <laughs> so what? Uh, the Bible says so. Where? Verse 9? <laughs> Verse 6. Verse 6. See, in this class you'll know that I will never take a general answer. I want a specific passage. I want where it says it and exactly what it says. And that will train you to stick with the book and get your answers right out of the book, chapter and verse. So we've learned the occasion. I'm going to review you over and over again on things so that you'll get to know them. Okay. Now, see, let's start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We thank God always concerning you, making mention in you of our prayers unceasingly. Now, see, that's the kind of verse that it usually, if we're reading the Bible, we just kind of yawn and, and skip that. as not been that big a deal. But see, it, it seems like a bigger deal when you get over to 2.13 and he comes back to it and says, For this reason we also thank our God unceasingly. And then when you get back over to chapter 3, verse 9, when he just about loses it and says, For what thanksgiving can we possibly give to God for you because of the joy with which we rejoice over you night and day, uh, being exceedingly desirous to see your face, you know, and fill up what is lacking in your face. So this makes a lot more powerful when you see the other thank gods that are there. But you see that this thank God wouldn't mean nearly as much to you unless you knew about those other thank gods that were uh, coming along behind it. And that's what happens when you do exegetical work. It causes you to go back to the beginning and say, wait a minute here. Maybe I ought to look a little bit harder at that first place because I didn't realize all the rest of this was here. And when you realize why Paul said that, why he was so thankful, 
Why was he so thankful in, in, in the real short way of saying it? What was he so thankful about? Levi, do you remember? The Thessalonians were still faithful. They were still faithful and they hadn't given up. Uh, there's a friend of mine that I love very much that I helped train in Bear Valley. And uh, I, he, he preached the gospel faithfully for 15 years after he left Bear Valley. And uh, he ended up uh, having an alcohol problem. And today, as far as I know, he's a drunk. And he uh, uh, is uh, a bad husband and a bad father, and he's destroying himself. He may even be dead, I don't know. I can't tell you how much that grieves me. It makes me sad. And it, it breaks my heart. If I were to see him and find out that he would, had straightened out his life and that things were good with him, you just can't know the joy that would give me. How, how thankful I would be for that. That's what Paul was feeling when he wrote this letter. He said, we thank God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers. I think he was probably <coughs> in the names of people that he had converted there in, in, in Thessalonica. He says, unceasingly remembering your work of faith and your labor of love and the steadfastness of your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to underline the word steadfastness in verse 3. The reason that's important, some of your translations will say patience of hope. But there's two kinds of patience. There's one patience, which is the Greek word makrothumia, which means you're being long-suffering with other people. You're being patient with your brother. You're being long-suffering with them. This patience, hupomones, is a word which means not giving up, hanging in there when, the, when it gets tough, refusing to quit. That's what this word means. And this word is so important in the Thessalonian epistle because that's exactly why Paul was so glad was because they refused to quit. They did not give up their hope. They had steadfastness of their hope. They were still being faithful. Who told them they were still being faithful, Brother Roger? Timothy. Timothy did because he just got back, didn't he? You know that for a fact? Yep. How do you know it for a fact? Because he sent him and then he returned and gave him the news. That's not how you know it, though. How do you know it? Put your finger on a passage and tell me how you know it. Help him out, somebody. Chapter 3, three verse 6. six. Chapter 3, verse 6 is how you know it. Okay, that's the only way you know it. See, you don't know it because I said it. You know it because chapter 3, verse 6 says so. Okay, so Paul's so glad, and he remembers their work of faith, that they've continued to work faithfully, uh, their labor of love, they've continued to love God, and the steadfastness, the patience, the not giving up of their hope in our Lord Jesus Christ before God our Father. Back in the corner, tell me your name again. Doug. Doug. What's your question, brother? We have a visitor. Dan, can I make a real quick announcement? Is that my kite? That is my kite. How are you? Fine. Go ahead. Um, everybody, be sure to bring your Bibles and note-taking materials to chapel with you today. We're going to start something new in chapel, and you will need your Bible and note-taking materials. So uh, do the, be prepared for that in chapel. Sorry, Mike. Dan. Hey, Mike. Yes. yes. Do you mean you've actually started using your Bible in chapel there? Well, we're, we're going to try that and see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dan. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Okay. Um, let me show you something here. Look in verse 2 where it says, We thank God and... and J.R., I want you to write down on your paper or type in your computer or whatever you're doing there just the phrase, we thank God. And underline, we thank. 
See, we think, if, if, by the way, I don't know if I told you this or if Denny warned you about this, but in this class, here's what I want you to do. Amani, you can have that King James Bible open, but I want you to have a Greek text or a Greek interlinear open right beside it while you're in my class. Yes, sir. All right, so I want to, I want whatever English version of the Bible you have, but I want a Greek text or a Greek interlinear open right beside it all the time you're in my class. All right? The Greek word eucharistumen, eucharistumen, from the Greek verb eucharisteo, we thank God, that's the verb. But there are three Greek participles that go for, that work off of that word. Let me give you an example of how this works. This is a real simple example. You have the same kind of construction in, in Matthew 28, 19, where it says, make disciples. Make disciples is a verb. But the word baptizing is a participle, and the word teaching is a, is a participle. And baptizing and teaching tell you how to make disciples. Go make disciples. That's the verb. How do you make disciples? baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. See, both of those words work off of the word make disciples. So if you were drawing a little diagram, you'd say make disciples, and then underneath it you'd have baptizing with a little arrow back to make disciples, and teaching with a little arrow back to make disciples. See, that's how the, the text is structured. Well, in this case, we have we thank God... And then, making mention, see, making mention, see, as we're thanking God, we're making mention. That's one thing we're doing while we're thanking God. Then in verse 3, remembering, remembering also goes back to uh, we thank God. In other words, we thank God as we're remembering And then down in verse 4, knowing, brothers, beloved by God, so we thank God because we are knowing. So the word making mention, the word remembering in verse 3, and the word knowing in verse 4 all go back up to that verb, we thank, in verse 2. Mention all those again. All right. The main verb is we thank. In verse 2. The participles that explain why are making mention. Actually, just the word making, but making mention has to go with it. In verse 2. Remembering, verse 3. And knowing, verse 4. So what Paul is really saying is, while we're mentioning these things, and as we remember these things, and while we're consciously knowing these things, we just can't help but thank God for you people. But you have to see that structure in the text to see how it goes together. Another thing you have to look for in exegesis is grammatical structure. I don't know how much you talked about this or how much you were ready to talk about it because you haven't had very much grief, but it is important in putting passages together. But the main thing is Paul is just really, really thankful about what uh, he's hearing and what he knows and what he understands about these Thessalonians that he thought were maybe lost forever, and now he knows that they're still hanging in there and they're still faithful. Some of the greatest joy I get as a preacher... Uh, is to uh, uh, see somebody uh, come back to greet me that has been long gone and we baptized them many years ago and now they're teaching classes or they're an elder or they're, they're a great leader in the church and I didn't know what happened to them and they're still faithful and their families are faithful and I'm going, thank you God, that's just a wonderful blessing and, and that's what Paul is getting into right here. So he says, in verse 4, knowing, beloved, uh, brethren, beloved by God, your election. Well, we'll come back and uh, have some more class after chapel. See you in about 45 minutes. Thank you.